Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. I hope that you know in a dark world, the only people who can shine the light are right here. In a world full of deceit, if the truth is going to be declared, it has to come from us. And in a world ripe, with despair. The only source of hope is held in your heart. The passage we're looking at this morning from the book of Philippians is about that reality. And it's about how you could be in custody of that reality personally and not be discouraged, but have joy. That's what the text is about this morning. And we read it in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. This is what God says. I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, would you come to your people and give us joy and ministry and boldness and power to speak in Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Paul says that he wants you to know about what has happened to him. He talks about what has happened to me, and Paul is in a mess. It's, it's hard to imagine how the mess could get worse. The mess that Paul is writing about in Philippians chapter 1 begins in Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 21, he is attacked and almost murdered by a crowd of Jews in Jerusalem. For his pain and suffering, in Acts chapter 21, verse 33, he is arrested by Roman guards. In Acts 21, 33, when he is arrested by the Roman guards, that is the last time that he will be free in the entire New Testament, in the entire book of Acts, and for the rest of his life. In Acts chapter 23, verses 12 to 13, he is the focus of an assassination plot where more than 40 Jews swear that they're going to kill him or they are going to die. 
In Acts chapter 23, verses 23 to 24, he is held as a prisoner in Caesarea by Felix, the governor. In Acts chapter 24, he is held in prison for two years waiting for the payment of a bribe. I don't think this guy really did anything. I could let him out. I'm going to wait and see if I can get some money before I do what I ought to do and let him go. In Acts chapter 27, verse 1, he is transferred to Rome to make this arduous journey, and he's transferred under guard. In Acts 27, 42 to 44, he is shipwrecked and nearly executed. Having survived the shipwreck, the guards are going, we've got we to kill these prisoners because we can't worry about them escaping. But he survives the shipwreck and he survives the planned execution only in Acts 28 verse 3 to be bitten by a snake. He survives the snake bite but still ends the book of Acts in Acts chapter 28 verse 30 in prison at his own expense. That's where he is. That is what is going on in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, when he talks about his mess, but he doesn't call it a mess. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. This is how he describes his mess. The apostle Paul, wrongly imprisoned, nearly executed, shipwrecked, surviving a snake bite, paying his own bills in prison, says, guys, the system's working. The gospel's going out. It's, it's happening. This is a crazy way to talk, and you know it's a crazy way to talk because it's not the way you would talk. If this was you... Writing this down with snake scars on your finger, imprisoned, awaiting a trial that might never come, you would say, somebody get me out of here. You don't know how bad it is up here. They're, they're locking me up and throwing away the key. This is a disaster. This is a travesty. This is an absolute miscarriage of justice. Somebody get me out of here. It's not what Paul says. It's not what Paul does. It's not how Paul thinks. He says, guys, the gospel is going out. He is rejoicing in this mess. And in a world that is darkened by sin, our situation isn't as bad as the one Paul's facing. Things are going pretty well for you in Jacksonville, Florida in 2024 compared to the Apostle Paul. But in a world that isn't as dark as the one we're reading about, but it's still pretty dark, we need to find this kind of joy. We need to be able to figure out how Paul gets in this frame of mind where he could rejoice in a system that's broken and doesn't seem to work. I think in these passages, the apostle gives us three changes that we need to make if we want to think about life the way he thinks about it. And here's the first change that the apostle Paul commends to us. We need to turn from a commitment to comfort to a commitment to ministry. We need to turn from being committed to our comfort to being committed to ministry. 
This is the eye of the tornado for us. Because so many of us are committed to comfort and not ministry. That commitment to comfort is why we hardly ever do ministry. Because we're working on our comfort, working on saving up our money. We're working on protecting our reputation and our assets. So our wheels are always spinning to make sure life is wonderful and comfortable and happy for us. It's that commitment that keeps us from doing ministry, and it is that commitment that is one of the reasons why so few people in our world today know the truth about Jesus and have believed it. Because we're committed to our comfort. Now listen, comfort's a good thing. It's a great thing if you can get it. It's just a bad thing to be committed to. It's a bad thing to be obsessed with. And the Apostle Paul was not committed to comfort. He was committed to ministry. It's why verse 12 makes sense in the mess that he's in. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, nearly murdered a couple of times, wrongly accused, illegally held, paying my own bills in prison, all of those things have happened to me but here's the thing, all that has really served to advance the gospel. You hear in those words what he cares about. If what he cared about was his comfort, he would go, guys, I'm in a mess. I can't get out of prison. I'm locked in this system. I nearly died on this boat. Snakes are biting me. Everything's gone wrong. But that's, that's not what he says because that comfort is not what he cares about. What he cares about is ministry. What he wants is the gospel to advance. What he wants is the word of Jesus to be proclaimed. And he's like, guys, that's happening. And so because his heart is in the right spot, because his commitments are pointed in the right direction, he can look at things that are unpleasant and go, this is great. This is great because if the gospel is going out, that's my commitment. Paul had an obsession with Jesus and with preaching Jesus that we need more of. You need more of. What? what what would happen if there was just a little bit more passion in the heart of every person in this room for Jesus? What if we spent a little bit of the energy we spend looking for iPhones and finding funny video clips and managing our money in the stock market and finding great places to eat and fun things to do. What if we took just a little bit of that energy and spent it on Jesus? Things would be so much more different. The apostle Paul is obsessed with ministry. He's been gripped by Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he says, if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. I don't get a pat on the back when I preach the gospel. It's not a attaboy. Good job, Paul. When I, when I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. Why? Necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul is, is writing as a man and ministering as a man who is enslaved to Jesus. He's not enslaved to comfort and fun and ease. 
He sees Jesus. He sees hell that lasts forever. He sees a glorious heaven. He sees a high king of the universe. And he says, I'm, I'm committed to this man. I'm committed to this message. I'm committed to this ministry. I don't, I don't get any pats on the back for that. I'm doing what I have to do. In Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm under obligation to everybody. I'm under obligation, Paul says, to the whole world, so I am eager to preach the gospel. Because Paul is focused on Jesus, he's able to pay attention to other people and not view other people as those who owe him something not view other people as those who are standing in the way of him getting something that he wants. He sees that he's obliged to those people. He's able to look at the server at lunch and not get frustrated because the food didn't come out the way he ordered it. He sees in that person an obligation to love Jesus. He's able to look at the person who comes over to do a repair on the house or work on the yard or help with the utilities. And he doesn't see a servant who is supposed to do his bidding. He's the servant. He's obliged to them. It's a completely different way of looking at people. And we don't have it, do we? We need more Jesus. We need to be more like Paul and turn away from this obsessed commitment we all have to a comfortable little life that isn't going to last anyway and turn to being committed to ministry and ministry in Jesus' name. That's the first change. Second change is we need to turn from silence to speaking. We need to turn from silence to speaking. Verse 13 says, It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul has been locked up for preaching Christ. He has been locked up for years and will be locked up for the rest of his life all for preaching Christ. And he says, the reason this whole situation is serving the gospel, is serving the ministry of Jesus, is because everybody knows that the reason I'm locked up is for Jesus. Now here's the question. How do they know that his imprisonment was for Jesus? You know? He told them. He told them. When he's chained up to the guards, when they come in to bring him his food, when they transfer guards, when they put him in a different spot, the apostle Paul won't shut his mouth. He keeps telling them, I am here for Jesus. I'm here for the hope of Israel. I'm here to preach the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for sinners. Won't you believe? That is a really stupid thing to do if you're committed to comfort. If you're committed to comfort, it's a really stupid thing to do. Hey, Paul, shut up. 
This Jesus thing, Paul, is what has you in the cuffs in the first place. Shut up. Take a break. Get out of jail. Let's talk about the Jesus thing when they take the shackles off. But that's not what Paul does. And the reason it's not what Paul does is because Paul isn't committed to comfort. He's committed to ministry. He's committed to Jesus. And so he speaks, because what else would he do? I, I can't be quiet about this Jesus thing. I can't be quiet about Jesus if it's going to make my life easier. What are you talking about? Make a, make a bargain with the devil and be quiet about the good news of eternal life for everyone who believes? You want me to be quiet about that? That's stupid. That's foolish. To trade a few hours, a few months, a few years of comfort for eternal life that comes to the whole world in the name of Jesus when you believe? The Apostle Paul can't do it. He can't be quiet when being quiet would help because his understanding of his problem is not that he is uncomfortable. His understanding of the problem is that people don't believe. And so here's, here's the question for you. When you think about the problems in your life, what do you see? What you ought to see is that you have moms and dads and sons and daughters and grandparents and grandkids and next door neighbors and aunts and uncles and coworkers and people in your classes at school who are going to hell. That's the problem. And there is a glorious, infinite, wonderful solution. And it is found in Jesus. And all they need to do is believe in Jesus and they'll be saved forever, but they can't believe in what they don't hear. And they can't hear if you don't share. There are some people in the world alive today and their only shot at hearing about Jesus is from you. You're their only shot. They're not going to come into this church on their own. They don't know who I am. They don't know who your Sunday school teacher is. They don't know anything about this place. You are their point of contact with Jesus and you are being quiet. Why? Well, they, they might hate me. Yeah, they might. They might. They, they might think I'm, they might think I'm weird. Yeah, they might. And you are, by the way. It, it might end our relationship. If they know I'm one of these people who believes the Bible, who thinks that Jesus is the only way, they might say they don't want any part of me. You, you go to that church? Really? Yeah, all those things could happen. But you know what also could happen? <laughs> they could turn from their sins and believe in Jesus. They could be gloriously saved. They could be gloriously saved this afternoon. They could be gloriously saved on Easter. Yeah, all the bad things could happen, but glorious things could happen too. And you'll never know until you speak up. And do you know what? If the worst happens and they hate you forever, no one in this room is at any more risk than the Apostle Paul was. 
And the Apostle Paul confronting all the danger, all the risk, all the broken relationship. He says, guys, let me tell you something. Everybody knows that I'm here for Jesus. Everybody knows that. Guys, come on. In just the quietness of your own heart, can you say that? Can you say everybody who knows me knows I'm here for Jesus? Everybody who knows me has heard me speak about life in Christ. Let me ask you another one. Who's coming with you to Easter next week? Who's coming with you to one of these concerts? Who's coming with you to Easter Sunday celebration? Who's coming with you to lunch afterwards? There's no, there's no handcuffs on you. You're not tied to a guard. You get to come in here, listen to music, and eat ham. Guys, this is not a challenge. This is not hard. The only question is, do you believe it? Do you really think it's true? Are you really willing to let go of some comfort to honor Jesus and see people be saved? That's the question you have to answer. If you're committed to ministry, you will speak. No one will be able to keep you quiet. And if you're not speaking, it's because your commitments are all whacked up. If we're going to rejoice the way the Apostle Paul does, if we're going to be committed to behaving the way he's behaving, we've got to turn from a commitment to comfort to a commitment to ministry. We've got to turn from silence to speaking. And then we lastly need to turn from fear to confidence in the Lord. We need to turn from fear to confidence in the Lord. Verse 14 says, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Does that strike anybody else as strangely as it strikes me? Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. How does that happen? Paul's locked up. You hear that he's been locked up. This is, this is the great preacher to the Gentiles raised up specifically by Jesus Christ. And for his faithfulness, he's rotting in prison. And the response when you hear it is, I'm going to preach the gospel that way too. Huh? What he says they don't do is what you would expect them to do. What you would expect is you hear this faithful man who's doing it right, got locked up, and you'd be like, oh boy, I'm going to just be quiet. If they're, if they're throwing the big dog in jail, I am going to sit quietly and we'll say our little prayers before we have our family dinner. And uh, if anybody asks, I'll say whatever I need to say, but I'm not going to come on too strong or anything like that because I don't want to get in the same trouble. That's what you're supposed to do. But that's not what they do. When they hear about his imprisonment, instead of being afraid that the same thing is going to happen to them, they get bold. How? How's that happen? Well, it says they've become confident in the Lord. Isn't that something? They heard about his imprisonment and they became confident in the Lord. Let me, let me tell you a fact, all right? So if you're focused on your comfort, 
and you're being quiet and you're afraid something bad's gonna happen to you when you preach the, the gospel of Jesus faithfully, let me just tell you right now, it is. Okay? Uh, something bad is going to happen to you when you preach this gospel. Paul got locked up. I, I have people who don't speak to me anymore. I have a lot of people that think I'm a total weirdo. Some of you have relationships like that too. That's going to happen. And the reason it's going to happen is because Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If the world hated Jesus, guys, the world's going to hate you too. So that's the way it is. All right, let's just clear the decks on that. It's, that's the way it is. It's, it's not going to be easy because it's not supposed to be easy. All right, so you go and you share Jesus with your aunt. And she says in a really nice way that she'd rather be dead than come to Easter service with you next week. And it's all a little uncomfortable and a little awkward. Okay, there. Now that happened. Now you are going to respond in one of two ways. You're going to be afraid and back off. Ooh, I don't like that. It was an unpleasant conversation with Aunt Lucy, and I don't want that to happen again. Uh, every time I bring up Jesus to one of my kids, they flip out on me, and we're going to sue for peace, comfort. And I'm not going to do that again. That's one option. Or the other option is you could have confidence in the Lord. You could look to the Lord and be confident in who he is and what he is doing. You could be confident in the Lord. There's so many, the whole Bible is written so that you'd have confidence in the Lord. So that you would know that God loves you. That's what this whole salvation thing is about, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. You can have confidence in the great love of God for you when the trouble comes. You could have confidence that trouble or no, the only way of salvation for the people you say you say you love the only way they're getting saved is through Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There's no other way, folks. You could have confidence in the glorious promise of Romans 8, 28, that God no matter what bad things happen to you, no matter what bad things people think about you, no matter how much you're rejected, God is going to work all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There's so many things that when you face that threat and when you face that trouble, there's so many things to move you from fear to confidence. But I got to tell you, I got this note just this morning, just as I was walking in here from Sasha, precious member in our congregation. And I want you to hear what she wrote to me. Dear Pastor Heath, in heaven, God is waiting for us. With us, we will take our everlasting praises with pure spirits there. We will be with him forever because Jesus is so merciful to us day after day. We are God's children and he is so loving. Jesus will prepare a place for us. In heaven, there will be no more pain, sorrow, or crying. We can only imagine 
if you and I stand beside Jesus one day and Jesus will say, come dear Sasha and come dear Heath, you are my son and daughter, come my child and I will give you rest. He knows every pain and challenge that we face in our lives. God created you in his own image. This is, this is truth that this precious girl is writing. It's confidence in who Jesus is. It's confidence about what is waiting for everybody who trusts in Jesus. Do you have this kind of confidence? Do you know Jesus? If you do, you must You must, you must lay down your life for the one who gave his life for you. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be men and women and boys and girls who preach the gospel of Jesus. I pray when trouble comes or when the threat of trouble comes, we would turn from a commitment to comfort to a commitment to ministry in Jesus' name. I pray we'd turn from silence to opening our mouths and speaking. And I pray, Father, we'd move from fear to bold confidence in Jesus who gave his life for us and will give every good thing to us. In Jesus' name, amen.